Hello, and welcome back to the first episode of season two of the Dr. Karina Smith podcast. We made it to a second season. <laughs> I think that that's worth celebrating. Apparently a lot of people do one season of a podcast and then they never come back. But um, I had an amazing time making the first season and dipping my toe into something I'd never done before. And I'm really excited about bringing you another season. If you're a first time viewer slash listener, welcome and big welcome and um, thank you to those of you that are returning to come and listen to me say more stuff about yin yoga and or Chinese medicine. <laughs> Both of those worlds are pretty massive, which means I have oodles of scope to pick different topics that I find exciting. And in this season, there'll be a lot more of that. And I've got some really lovely people that I'm bringing on to have great conversations with as well. Great yoga teachers, great Chinese medicine practitioners. It's going to be well worth the listen. So in this episode, I can't believe it took me all of, I can't believe I didn't bring this topic up in season one, but in this episode, I would like to talk about skeletal variation. Anybody that knows me in the yoga community in Melbourne or anybody that's read any of my blogs or anyone that has sat in on any of my trainings will know this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. And I hope that this episode helps you to become passionate about it as well. It, and it's not something that's exclusive to yoga. If you live in a human body, which I think is everybody <laughs> listening, if not, I'd like to hear about that. If you live in a human body and you move and you exercise and you have some kind of movement diet, then I think you will be really interested to know about skeletal variation, especially if you have been uh, in the past, if you've done any kind of intense physical training in something specific like weightlifting or yoga or ballet or gymnastics or Pilates or anything like that, where it has its own system and there are quite often very particular alignment cues about how you're supposed to do something correctly. I'm making inverted commas with my fingers here, if you're just listening and safely, because what I have come to realize is that whilst it's really important to have a template of ideas about how you move your body in shapes, especially in yoga, when we talk about yoga postures, there's going to be a percentage of people in the room that because of their skeleton and they won't, they, they probably won't even know that that's what it is. There's going to be a percentage of people in the room that simply cannot get their body to do the strong instruction that you're giving them to do if that makes sense. So I'm going to unpack this quite a bit. The basic premise of skeletal variation is that you the listener, me the talker, both live in a human body, I think. I'm going to assume you do. Uh, technically speaking, we have a similar skeleton in that um, we have a lot of the same bones in the same place that do the same thing. But the, the actual length, um, orientation, bone structure of my skeleton versus yours is going to be different. If I had 20 people here in the room with me, we all have totally different skeletons. And why that's really important to know about movement is that when you're moving a joint, let's say you're bending your elbow and bend my elbow for those of you watching, when you're bending your elbow, essentially, when we're talking about moving a joint to its end range of motion. So if I bend my elbow and I'm folding my forearm in toward my bicep, essentially the thing that stops me is compression. In this instance, it's the flesh of my forearm and the flesh of my bicep squeezing to a point where I can't move that any further. In most of the synovial joints in the body, your, your end range of motion, all of them actually, your end range of motion at a joint is determined by the shape of that joint. So if you've got two people whose joints are different shapes, as in 
the ends of the bones might be a bit more bulbous or let's say the, the hook at the back of the elbow is a little bit shallow for some people or deep for some people. The, the way that their limb looks when they come to their end range of motion is going to be different. And, and if you step back from that a little bit more, what that means is that if you come to a practice like yoga, where over the years it's sort of been boiled down to these very strict scripts of instruction, I like to think it's changing now, the pendulum is definitely swinging, there's this kind of idea that there's a right way to do it according to how it looks with your alignment and everything else is wrong or you're, you'll get there one day. Red flag, when you hear that line in a yoga class, one day your insert body part getting somewhere here, one day your heels will get to the floor in downward dog, or one day your hips will open in pigeon pose. Because the thing is, if someone's been practicing yoga for a really, really long time, the, the thing that's probably coming up in their body when they're trying to get further in a posture is their skeleton. And it's difficult because you can't see into somebody's body as a yoga teacher and, and see the, the shape of their bones because we don't have x-ray vision. What you can see is their hands and their feet and their knees, the outer, the outer frame, the, the meat suit. <laughs> And so what we've kind of done over years and years is go, all right, what, what in, the, in the outer body can I look to to give a, an alignment cue to trust that something uniform will be going on at the deep joints that I can't see, like the hips or the shoulders? So I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more and maybe give some examples as we go along. I'll just sort of preface it with this and say, oh, one of the ways that I think is the most powerful to help kind of um, navigate our way through this, particularly if you're someone who's listening to this and you've just done a yoga teacher training. <laughs> I don't want to pop your bubble and make you think, how do I cue people if everyone's bones are different? How, how do I even know what's a, a good template amount of cues to give? What I think we're really trying to do at the end of the day is like have a basic score of how we're doing a shape, but really put the onus back on the student to pay attention to what they're feeling. Because if a student's coming to class and the teacher is giving all the cues and the teacher has got a big personality and they're very um, convincing in what they say, they've got a lot of conviction. I think a lot of the time students just come to class and sort of hand that authority over to someone that's not in their body, hand that authority over to a teacher, which means there's sometimes a bit of a disconnect between what I'm feeling, but what I'm supposed to be feeling because the teacher said so. So I'm going to kind of ignore a little bit of what I'm feeling because I must just be wrong if I'm not doing, doing it right, which is what they've, they've said. And there can be a bit of ignoring of um, red flags going on there, yellow flags pale yellow flags, but also it's kind of taking away from the student to be able to know what they're feeling and know if what they're feeling is something related to the soft tissues in their body, or if actually what they're feeling is the hard, maybe stuck, firm feeling of a joint that's closed in, com in compression that actually has nowhere to go, that doesn't really warrant much um, value in forcing forcing more of your efforts in that same direction. I hope that that makes sense. So I'll tell you a story. <laughs> um, the first time that I was introduced to these notions of skeletal variation and the idea of, of, of a tensile force in the body versus a compressive force in the body, tensile being feeling the, the soft tissues of your body get stretched tight and long when you're in a posture and that restricting you from going further versus a compressive sensation, which is body parts meeting, whether they be soft, you know, fleshy body parts meeting, like I just talked about before with the forearm and the bicep, or a little bit firmer, like some flesh and a, a bone, or quite hard, two bones, two bones kind of pressing together. The first time I was introduced to these concepts was the first time I went to India, 
to do my second yoga teacher training, fresh off the back of doing a year-long teacher training in Melbourne. And it was amazing that the teacher training was set in an ashram. And I, I really had no idea what to anticipate sort of rolling into a lifestyle like that. So as, as um, short-term residents of that ashram, we, we were invited to live that life. Um, with a daily program of, of how everyone or the ashramites lived, which meant we got up super early and went to temple where we sat for quite a few hours listening to chants, joining in on the chants, listening to a lot of Hindi as Guru Dev spoke to the community. Luckily, there were enough of us to warrant tuning into a little transistor radio as we were receiving an English translation in our ears, which was very, very thoughtful and helpful. Um, and then we would do our yoga teacher training after that. We would sit and sit and have lessons. We would do a lot of asana. It was a very, very beautiful, rich, deep complement to some training that I'd done in Melbourne, which was a little bit more westernized. It was, it was wonderful to have both of those experiences and then see them, see them kind of melt into each other, see what resonated, see what I left behind. The anatomy component of that teacher training was having us just sit and watch Paul Grilly's uh, anatomy DVD, which at the time, admittedly, I thought was a bit lazy. <laughs> I thought, you're just going to Troy McClurus with a little anatomy video? Okay. But looking back, <laughs> I'm so, so grateful because even though I was, I was making a lot of notes and I was listening to what Paul Grilly had to say, who's kind of the, the grandfather of bringing this information to us, an epic yin yoga teacher, him and, him and Susie Grilly, his wonderful wife, it didn't quite dawn on me how important that information was that I was learning. And I, I proceeded to watch that content again and again years later, but it was it was actually remarkable and I think that that was actually a really, really clever way to incorporate the anatomy information into a yoga teacher training. Because you can go and study anatomy at university, which I've done three times, <laughs> three different universities I've studied anatomy. And when you're studying anatomy in a textbook, it's all illustrations. And if you're studying the musculature of the body, it's names of muscles, origins and insertions, here are the names of the bones, there's a lot of Latin to learn, um, here's how the joints work, but it's all quite removed from the human. There was nothing in any of those university trainings that really emphasised the, the variance in bones and the implication for movement. Um, one of those degrees was a podiatry degree, so it was very much about biomechanics and the physics of, of bodies moving through space. And in a very kind of scientific way, you know, peer-reviewed papers and literature and things that we had to read, uh, a lot of it was about interventions for things like flat feet or diabetic ulcers on the foot, uh, things like that. But I, I, on reflection, I think back and I wonder, I wonder if anybody that's learning that or teaching that knows about skeletal variation. Because a lot of people that I've met in yoga haven't known anything about this. And I've been blessed to have the opportunity to share this information with people that have done teacher trainings in the anatomy lectures and I love it so much because people have these extraordinary light bulb moments. Like, oh, that explains why I've been working on this posture forever and I simply cannot get my hips and my heels closer together. Oh, I've been trying to get my heels to the floor in downward facing dog for years. That's why. And actually giving them the information in the other part of the body to tell them that the reason their heels are not getting to the floor is because Maybe the bones at the front of the ankle are in compression. Or in the case of someone who has their hips and heels far apart in say child's pose, their, their femur bone or the flesh of their quadriceps and the front pointy asis bone of their pelvis might be compressing. Or their foot, their ankle might be compressing against the floor. 
and what that compression feels like. So when I said before that I think one of the most powerful things we can do to help bring this information to light is to start really giving our students the, the clues <clears throat> and the descriptors of what they would feel in their body if they were coming up against a compressive sensation. When you've got compression happening in the body, that, um, that front of the hip bones and, and thigh bone example is a really, really good one. When you've got that kind of compression happening and it's painful, it's not helpful to, to try and get more movement at that spot. It's, it's stuck. <laughs> With all the good intention in their hearts, a lot of yoga teachers would walk around to that kind of instance and think, oh, I've got a great adjustment for you and put their hands on the back of the sacrum and push them down further. Which opens up a whole other tangent of things I could talk about because that's gonna make that way more painful for the student. And I reckon nine times out of 10, that student's not gonna say anything back. They're just gonna grimace and go, oh, help. <laughs> they might just think, oh, I guess this is supposed to hurt. Or they, they may not wanna make a fuss or they may not want to disrespect the teacher. A whole lot of psychological things can be going on there. But in, in compressive circumstances, <coughs> it's not really a valuable thing to be sitting into that kind of pinching pain. It's not, it's not going to do you any good. It's not, it's not something that we're supposed to experience on the path to enlightenment. It doesn't really have a helpful use. It, on the flip side, <laughs> that's the body trying to communicate to you to move. Ow, this is hurting me. Something weird happens in yoga where we, we don't listen to that or we think that that's not worthy of being listened to. That's another tangent. I'm just going to throw out a few tangents that I may or may not come back to. So when you are in a yoga posture, let's use yoga because that's that's my bag. When you're in a yoga posture and there is that painful pinching compression, compression sensation, the only real <clears throat> tool that you have at your disposal is to make space. And what that making space usually means is to move those body parts away from each other. <laughs> and that is where things get a little bit tricky when we're thinking about the idea of very strict alignment cues for quote unquote safety. This is how you do the pose safely. This is how you do it correctly. One, one person trying to do it in the correct way is actually going to be very painful then, for them because of the shape of their bones. And to somebody who's learning to teach yoga or already teaching yoga that's not aware of this, even though you're coming from a really good place, what you're doing is communicating to that student that, they, that the painful position is correct and so they sort of have to grapple with that psychologically and physically because when you start to make space around compression you're going to be coloring outside the lines of what we've been told is the you know safe alignment for a particular posture and all the yin yoga trainings that I've been present at that I've that I've I've done myself as a student this is kind of one of the beautiful tenets that this sort of aesthetic idea of what a posture is supposed to look like is nowhere near as important as, as what it feels like to you. Because the feeling is giving you really important information about whether you need to move something. Something else that I think is really important as well, because I spend a lot of time with um, budding yoga teachers and yoga teachers wanting mentorship is inviting them to start to have a different perspective around the actual posture itself. When you're doing yoga teacher trainings, because there's such a vast amount of information that needs to be packed into a couple of hundred hours, <laughs> it, it, it's so much. So what essentially has happened over time is that to make things quicker and more efficient, we've gone posture by posture, here are the 10 things that you have to do with your body to do this correctly. Here's the script. This is how you do it safely. Bang, stamp that, next one. There's not a lot of nuance in there or scope to 
kind of play with it or develop a relationship with it because we've got all these other lessons and topics. But maybe that's actually what we're supposed to be doing on the path of yoga is continuing to explore. My invitation though is to invite people to start to consider the pose in terms of its intention. Now what does that yoga posture actually uh, have on offer for you to experience? What happens in your body when you do it? Do you feel particular muscles contract? Do you feel a particular amount of space turn up? Are you feeling any part of your body stretching? What does the pose do for you? Rather than this foot has to be at this very particular angle, this back hip has to be turned in to this particular degree, the arms must be in line with this, the biceps must be in line with the ears. Very, very, very particular cues that a percentage of people, because of their bones, will, um, it'll be skeletally impossible for them to do that. And we come to the mat with enough that we're processing, enough stories that we're working through, enough self-development that's already happening or, or not. <laughs> and we're sitting in a lot of pain or a lot of discomfort emotionally. I don't think it's fair to be giving strict alignment cues in that way to set up the conditions for somebody to think that they're not good at yoga because they can't get their heels to the floor or they're not good yet. One day I'll get there and on that day I'll be good at this but today I'm not good because we've got that habit of absolute statements. And what I think that invitation of um, feeling the intention of the pose can do, what I think its potential is, is to actually invite you to enjoy where you are and to cultivate more self-acceptance about the body that you have. I think it's a beautiful gateway to cultivate deep self-love, which is a beautiful thing. So for example, if if we were thinking about a posture like Trikonasana, I do use this example a lot, Trikonasana, for those of you that practice yoga, it's a standing posture that builds strength in the legs. Its intention is to build leg strength. When your legs are solid, <laughs> then your upper body has the freedom to move around. And we tip the body over to the side. So it bends the spine to the side, depending on, depending on how much movement is going on in the pelvis. <clears throat> the degree at which you bend that spine to the side is gonna be different from person to person because you've got all variants up the spine as well. So I don't think it matters how far you go. The intention is that it opens the spine. So you just go as much as you want, as much as feels like you can breathe, you're not getting any pain. <clears throat> and you're not getting any rising panic. And you're really mindful of what you're feeling as you do it. So you're building your own relationship with the posture because that's gonna feel different from day to day as well. Something we talk about a lot in yin yoga is the soft tissues of the body, you know, all of the, the yin tissues. And when I say soft, I mean that they're not a bone, <laughs> but they're tough. Ligaments are tough. Tendons are tough. Connective tissue is tough. Your muscle cells are all packaged up in many, many cylinders of connective tissue. And from day to day, depending on when you practice, the amount of pliability you feel in those tissues is going to change. So even if you've got this amazing relationship with Trikonasana, if you practiced it tomorrow morning, first thing, and it was in the middle of winter, it's going to feel really, really different than if you practiced it in the afternoon on a hot summer's day. Because your body is going to feel different um, due to the, the temperature. First thing in the morning, the body is stiffer because you've been laying still all night and fluid's been pulled from particular tissue to other tissue and then that changes over the course of the day. 
So when we're really paying attention to what we feel and we've been given some kind of information about what, what it means to feel certain things, that's very empowering. I think that's very empowering. And it gives the practice back to the student. Because at the end of the day, the student lives in their body, the teacher doesn't live in the student's body. So whatever happens on the mat needs to be signed off on by that student. That the teacher's not going to be there in the morning when someone gets out of bed and thinks, oh, gee, I really went pretty deep in that, uh, that uh, dancer's pose in that hot room yesterday. Ooh. Teacher's off doing something else. So your body is where you live. It's really important that you get to decide what happens and how, how much or how little you're exploring with your movement. And as I said, this isn't exclusive to yoga. You know, if you think about, if you go to Paul Grilly's website, you can look that up. G-R-I-L-L-E-Y. He has all these incredible pictures of bones where he's consciously um, chosen these bone specimens where he can lay two scapula side by side or, or two, two or more femur bones side by side um, or um, uh, what's this called? Humerus bone, <laughs> a couple of humor, humeri side by side and you can see how different they are. And all of those are free to download. You know, when you train with Paul Grilly, he says, please download these and share the information. So if you think about the, the femur bones, you may not be able to, I'll, I'll try and explain this the best that I can if you're not watching this. You've got a long bone, and then at the end of that bone, you've got a round head that comes off. There is so much variation that can happen just in that part alone. The head can be at all sorts of different angles. It can be sort of 90 degrees. It can be um, angled a lot, more, uh, a lot more further up than that. The space between the actual bone and the, the ball, that little kind of gap is called the neck of the femur. And for some people that's quite long. For some people it's pretty much non-existent. So just contemplate for a moment just how variable that bone alone could be. And then you go ahead and you, you take the head of that femur and it articulates into the hip socket of the pelvis. And that hip socket has got an extraordinary amount of variation as well. This is the most variable part of the body and you can't see it. <laughs> and it's so relevant to yoga and squatting because of how much, how much we try and externally rotate or internally rotate or move our legs, move our femurs inside that socket. So people can have a really shallow hip socket, they can have a really deep hip socket, they can have a hip socket that's facing down or up or to the side. And the other thing is, it can be different from side to side. So when people say, oh, this is my tight side, this is my bad hip, this is my good hip, <laughs> because we do so much, uh, so much asymmetrical work in yoga, I would like to posit that, and especially if they do yoga a lot and, and they've, they've stretched their soft tissue a lot, I'd like to posit that the tightness that they're feeling, quote unquote, is quite possibly the compressive feeling of the head of that femur and or the neck of that femur getting to its end range of motion in that hip socket, whether it's being externally rotated, internally rotated, abducted, adducted, flexed, <laughs> extended, because you've got all the movements in that particular place in the body. But it's kind of, it, it's hard to know what that feeling is because it's down inside all these layers of tissue. You've got all the glute tissue, you've got um, a, a, an enormous amount of bandaging around that joint of the, the ligament, the ligamentous capsule, to protect it so you're stable because you walk on your legs. But when you can't go any further, um, I'm, I, that's me pulling on a femur bone, when you can't go any further and you don't know that that's why and you're having somebody tell you one day your hips will open, do this, 
the shin should be here, the hips should be square, all these very particular rules, dogmatic approaches with the body. What can happen is that when you've got nowhere else to go, that's me pressing my fist against my hand, when you've got nowhere else to go in one joint, but you continue to put force in that direction, something in the body has to take up that force, which means a joint below or a joint above will move because it can. It's not that it wants to, but your body moves where it can because that's where there's space to do so. And typically what happens with people when the hip cannot move anymore is that that stress will be felt in the knee. And a lot of people injure their knees in yoga. And it's usually in some kind of a position where the thigh bone is externally rotated and can't go any further or it's internally rotated and it can't go any further. <clears throat> Classic for that is Padmasana, Lotus Pose. Or I want to say Virasana, Hero's Pose, if you're trying to sit between your feet and you, your bones are not naturally designed for internal rotation. And if you injure that meniscus in the knee or you tug and tear on the kind of medial collateral ligament or even just the attachments of the uh, adductors because all of that sort of on that medial joint line and maybe you're practicing yoga six days a week and you think to yourself, oh, I'm getting a bit of a burning, tugging feeling around my knee. That must just be part of it because one day my hips are going to open. Your body's been trying to signal to you to stop. That hurts. Please stop. And we push through and we end up with an injury there. Well, there are things to be learned for sure. Injuries have always got a lesson in them, but it's, it's a bit of a bummer. <laughs> Because that tissue, that's, that strong yin tissue, it's white. When you, when you pull it out of the body, it's white. It doesn't have a lot of blood supply. Which means if it gets torn or severed or ruptured, oh, you'll be leaning into cultivating patience <laughs> with a little side dish of frustration, maybe. And the body was like, hey, I tried to warn you. I was screaming at you to stop, but you didn't because, I don't know, somewhere out in front of you there was this carrot being dangled telling you one day you'll get there. I think the other thing that's difficult about this, and it's, not, it's, it's no one's fault, but you, you only have the experience of what it feels like in your body. So if you're a teacher of any kind of movement, giving instructions, it's really, really easy to fall into the trap of cueing to the room what to feel according to what you feel when you do it. You don't have any other reference point. You only get a reference point when someone comes up to you and says, I can't do that, or that hurts me, or I really don't like that posture, and you get a shock and think, oh, I had no idea that people couldn't do it because I can do it. And you quickly learn that people's bodies are different and then you start thinking to yourself well, why 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 are they different how how can I offer more options for this posture so that everybody can be comfortable I think that's what I love so much about yin yoga is that it's not actually about the shape at all it's about getting access to the the body parts that are targeted in that shape so you could do a totally different posture and still be getting access into the backs of the legs, for example, or the tissue of the back. I, I love the idea of that kind of target area approach being offered to flow yoga, honestly. So if someone's trying to do trikonasana and they're just, it's just not a vibe, <laughs> and, and trikonasana has within it that gift of bending the spine to the side, why couldn't they just do a different side bend? We're all still bending our spines. You know, if you bend your spine in one posture, it's not going to be bending too differently in another posture. When I was learning yoga um, early, I, I, really th I really felt that there was some kind of magic in the pose. 
like Trikonasana is a special pose that does very magical things in the body that can't be done in any other posture. I don't really subscribe to that idea anymore because I think there are, uh, there are lots of ways to get access into the body. And getting that access into the body is magnificent for somebody that hasn't been able to get a stretch in their lower back, for example. And the more that I learn about acupuncture and the flow of chi in the body and meridians and thinking about prana and nadis, whatever movement that you do is moving chi and prana in your body. As long as you're moving all body parts on some kind of regular basis and you're, you're, you're taking care of your muscles and you're stretching them as well, that's helping chi to move, to move freely in the body. I think yoga's got that lovely addition of the, the, the concentration and the breath work as well. But I don't see any problem with someone saying, hey, I really, trikonasana is really not my bag. Do you mind if I do a standing side bend? I'm like, yeah, that makes sense to me. Or trikonasana is really not my bag. Could I do um, chair pose and work on my leg strength? I'm like, yeah. It might freak somebody out to do that and think, oh my God, everyone's going to be doing something totally different. How, how, do I, how do I gather my flock again? I'm going to lose everybody. Well, it might be that you just do it selectively and say, you know, this next standing static pose that we're going to work on is a leg strength posture. The intention is to build our leg strength. There are three options. We can, you can either work on trikonasana, chair pose or... Present lunge, maybe. You decide. Like, okay, great. I'm going to do crescent lunge. Pretty similar muscle groups are being used in all of those. I don't know. What do you think about that idea? <laughs> I think it's really exciting. This is a huge blind spot. And it's not anybody's fault because the blind spot is you can't see into the body, as I said before. But paying attention to what you feel and inviting your students to do the same, I think, is, is how you navigate what's happening in my body. What's my body trying to communicate to me? Not just now in the pose. But how do I feel uh, the evening of the class that I did? How do I feel in 24 hours? How do I feel in 72 hours? Because that is really important um, mindful practice as well. You know, what lingers in my body? Is it lingering because I just haven't rolled out my mat for ages and I'm sore? <laughs> but that, you know, sort of quote unquote good sore? Or am I getting a really strong message that I did something today that, that really pushed my edge and it was too much? Maybe. Hopefully it's, um, it's, enough, uh, it's enough information for you to then approach that differently the next time that you roll out your mat. So I highly encourage you to go and check out those bone pictures. And whatever, whatever has landed with you in this episode, to take it with you into whatever it is that you're doing next in terms of movement. It might be that you're at the gym doing squats. You might be at your Pilates class. You might be swimming. You might be going to yoga. And give yourself a really good amount of permission to be attentive to what sensations come up as your joints are being moved through their ranges of motion, particularly when they get to their end range of motion. And also give yourself permission to break a few rules. Try having your hands a little wider in downward dog. Try turning your feet out a little bit if you want to in bridge pose. You might ruffle some feathers, but um, I think that that could be a good thing. And ask yourself, what is the intention of this that I'm doing? And of this that I'm doing, what's the intention that it offers me to explore? What is it that I want to explore from this? Thank you so much for listening. Until next time. See you later.